I was very poor at reaching out for support. And I didn't want to admit that I was having a problem because, again, I felt like that was weak. And so my number one piece of advice is seek support, whether that's a friend or a colleague that you feel like you could talk to or a counselor or something like that. I would just seek help and talk to someone. I think that's huge. Welcome to Are You Satisfied? a podcast that explores what a deeply satisfying and fulfilling life looks like and how to live it. I'm your host, Dr. Sarah Murphy, award-winning naturopathic doctor. Today's guest is Dr. John Temple, a renowned orthopedic surgeon. He lives in Charlotte, North Carolina with his three kids and wife, Dr. Anna Maria Temple, a renowned holistic pediatrician. He's here today sharing his personal life story. The path to becoming a physician can be very interesting. Okay, welcome to the Are You Satisfied podcast, John. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. It's so good to have you here. Now, you have a great personal story that I want my audience to hear about. And I got to hear a little bit about it at a sushi dinner and salsa dancing night with our friends and colleagues. And I thought it would be a powerful story to share on this podcast. So thank you for being willing to come come on and share your personal story, really. Well, I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here. And as I told you at our dinner, if something out of my story can help someone maybe to not have as much struggle as I did through this, then I'm, I'm absolutely more than happy to share uh, something because when I was going through what I went through, I didn't feel like I had a whole lot of people that had been through what I had, or at least they didn't talk about it. And I'll give you, your listeners, maybe just the end. So I... Don't give them the end. Let's start at the beginning. Hold on. <laughs> so for the listeners, this is actually Dr. John Temple, and he's a renowned orthopedic surgeon. And so as a, let's go back to childhood. Like, did you grow up wanting to be a doctor? I absolutely did not. So I grew up in inner city Detroit uh, in a blue collar family. My dad was a police officer and my mom was a secretary. And if you're a police officer in Detroit, you have to live within the city inner city limits. And so we weren't in the greatest of neighborhoods and it was getting rougher and rougher. And, and finally, my father decided we need to get out of Detroit because it's just getting too bad. And so he drove down the entire east coast of the United States on back roads, just searching for a town to move his family. And decided on Asheville, North Carolina. And so picked up the family and I was in freshman in high school and moved us to Asheville, North Carolina. And it was a bit of a culture shock going from, you know, inner city Detroit to Asheville. But uh, yeah, and that's a tough age to move to, I feel like. I was more flexible. My older sister had a real tough time with it. I was transitioning right at the beginning of freshman year, but it was pretty tough. Uh, the thing that really sort of helped me make the transition was sports. I was madly into basketball and quickly turned that into my life. And, you know, I have to say going to Nashville was a great thing for me. I got in a lot of trouble as a kid. Despite my dad being a police officer, I had the police at the front door a fair amount of number of times. I was... I'm surprised, John. A <laughs> rambunctious <laughs> kid. <laughs> My, my grandfather said I'd either wind up in prison or doing something great, but it was a fine line. So what kind of things were you, what were you doing? Oh man, just from stealing hood ornaments off of cars to, you know, we chopped down all the neighbor's roses to make perfumes for a business. <laughs> uh, I was at a Catholic school and the nuns would just, you know, beat us up pretty good. And I would talk back to the nuns and then you know, they called my parents to school. I, I've always had an issue with authority, I think. And that sort of manifested itself into me acting out whenever I saw authority figures. So there's a whole litany of things. And I, eh. anyway, I, I won't get into uh, too many of those. <laughs> Just to say the transition for me was probably a good one because it got me away from many of these kids and influences that were sort of lead me down the path of destruction. Right. And interestingly, you know, I made always made A's in school but I always made F's in conduct, you know, in the little conduct uh, rating. And just, I just have always had this energy to do, to do things um, and just oftentimes didn't know how to direct it. <clears throat> and yeah, I think great entrepreneurs often, you know, yeah, a lot of those kids that are trouble kids are very smart and they're very, you know, rebellious, but it can also be flipped into a, a sign of um, some great, you know, uh, talents. <laughs> Right. 
And and uh, as a kid, I was curious, and I always wanted to be a scientist. That was my thing growing up. I want, I was love science, and I wanted to invent and create things. That's kind of what I grew up wanting to do. And when I made this transition, and I found sports, it's kind of my thing. I can, hey, I can pour ev- all this extra energy that was getting me in trouble. I found something to pour it into, and so. I actually, for, through high school, I kind of straightened up because I was so focused. I didn't want to do anything to sacrifice playing basketball. And so that became my life. And I had no interest in medicine. I, I actually fractured my spine in high school and we didn't go to doctors. So I played with it for about three weeks until my coach said I couldn't play anymore until I got it checked out and had a fractured spine and they made me sit out for six months and it was, you know, the most miserable six months of my life. And I said, I'm never going to doctors again because I associate them with not letting me do what I want to do. Right. And, and we uh, actually had a great senior year and we went to the North Carolina state championship. North Carolina is kind of this Mecca of basketball and played in the state championship. And I missed a three pointer at the buzzer that would have sent it to overtime. But that was sort of the the highlight of, of my high school. And unfortunately with that, I got a, offered a scholarship to play basketball in college. And this was one of the kind of the pivotal points coming is that I, I, it was really on top of the world. I had just played in the state championship and it was the summer before I was leaving for college on a full scholarship and everything was coming together for me. And then my world kind of started falling apart a little bit. Um, so within about six to nine months, my sister, who was a year older, got pregnant in college, got married, and sort of left the family and moved about 500 miles away. My, my father left my mother, and we stopped speaking. And then I broke up with my girlfriend, and then I had a falling out with my mom, and she kicked me out of the house. <clears throat> oh, my gosh. How old were you now? Uh, 18. 18, Okay. And so it put me in a situation I'd never been in. I'd never been in a situation where I had no support under me or just on my own. And when I was in high school, I had, I was always at the gym shooting around. My coach got tired of waiting all night for me to be done. And he just gave me a key to the gym. So after I finished my freshman year, I came home. I didn't have anywhere to live. And so I was, I started living in my high school gym in the locker room and it was miserable. And And I remember (laughs) I just, I laid there crying one night and I said, I will never, ever be in this position again. I will never be in a financial situation or be dependent on someone to where I'm living in a locker room. You know, you you make these decisions at the time and you have no idea how they're going to affect you down the road. All I knew Mm -hmm. is that I made a, I made an ultimate decision. Yeah. Fortunately, since I had a scholarship, once school came back around, I had a place to live, but kind of my dream of science and invention uh, was over. And I didn't know anything about medicine. And all I knew is that every doctor I knew was well off and seemed to have enough money to have a car and a nice house. And (laughs) I I saw our team orthopedist one day and I said, what do you do? And he goes, well, I do this and I do that and I operate on people and I take care of athletes. And I said, that fits what I need. Yeah. And and I decided one day that I'm going to go be an orthopedic surgeon. And that's that's sort of the whole way it came about. <clears throat> wow. And so was that you were 18 at that time when you decided that or 19, 20? Yeah, I was 19. I was into my next year of college. And okay. And I decided, hey, I'm going to go into medicine and be. OK. Actually, I said, I'm going to go be an orthopedic surgeon because I also found out they were at the high end of the food chain. And, you know, my goal at that point was financial stability. Yeah. So I said, I'm going to go be an orthopedic surgeon. Right. And, and you know, I've been, been very good in my life when I set goals and I, I'm very good at having something to chase, whether it be mm-hmm. a basketball scholarship or a career or a test score or something like that. So I set my goals on that and started getting through the process uh, and ultimately uh, went to medical school. And that's where I met my wife and we sort of had a med school, med school romance. Oh, that could be a whole nother podcast episode. I love hearing the romance stories. <laughs> uh, but med school is great. I, I love school. I, I, we should have you guys on the podcast together, actually, at some point. <laughs> we've done one of those. We, yeah. So we, <laughs> there's some bickering. There's some joking. Yeah. Uh, That'd be fun. We, we actually, we argued more in medical school than we do now. We, well, that's good, I guess. <laughs> we couldn't agree on anything in medical. We'd watch the show ER and we'd both battle back and forth on you know, who was right on the diagnosis and right. things like that. 
Well, and she's a pediatrician and you're an orthopedic surgeon. So there's a battle there, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So we went and did this couples match. So when you leave medical school, you can actually match as a couple and they put you in the same hospital for training. Uh, and so we ended up at Penn State and we did our training. Uh, so that was five year residency for me and hers mm-hmm. was three. But we also had two kids at the same time. Wow. And let's, I mean, let's talk about medical school because most people will never go to medical school. And I think we all know it's grueling. I did not go to traditional medical school, um, partially for that reason. (laughs) I thought it would be too hard um, and really not the type of medicine I wanted to practice. So, um, but my stepdad did say, well, why don't you go get your MD first and then your ND after that? And uh, I didn't do it. Um, but tell us, like, how was medical school? It must have been hard. So um, here's what I tell people when they ask me about medical school is that yeah. I, I didn't find that the content was so complicated you can understand it. It's the volume of stuff that you have to retain and, and then ultimately regurgitate is pretty unbelievable. Unfortunately, I don't think it trains the best doctors to have that skill. But if you have the skill and I have that skill of just being able to retain large amounts of information and put it back, you're going to do mm-hmm. well, you're going to do well at medical school. But I'll draw a contrast to residency because that was a whole different animal. But medical school to me, you know, it's, it's long periods of studying and then you blow it out with partying and fun um, when you get through exams. You know, the first two years is just book book learning. And then the second two years, you're actually out in the clinics and in the hospitals and you have no idea what's going on. And you're just kind of following people around like puppy dogs. And it's fairly belittling from that standpoint. But again, I, that, that's what I've kind of found med school is more of a, a volume problem than a yeah. complexity problem. Well, and how's the culture? Because I've also heard and read some stories about just the way that you're treated can be not so encouraging or nice. Yeah, that. we were kind of there during a transition process. So this is, you know, from 95 to 99 is when I was in med school. When it was starting, they were mm-hmm. trying to change some of that to where you know, you give the physicians this ultimate power to just belittle and beat down the medical students and and, and treat you poorly. And so w- my school actually fought to be more progressive with that. And it still happened, don't get me wrong. But, you know, I, I didn't have as much of that I found in medical school as I did further along in the training process. In residency. Right. So okay. so orthopedics, when I went to it, it's the, it was the most competitive specialty in medicine to get into meaning the most applications for very few spots. So you have to be kind of top of your class and everything in medical school to be eligible to get an orthopedic spot. Right. And male dominated, right? How many? Yeah. So the most male dominated specialty in all of medicine, 99.9% male. Wow. And, and I think probably more than more than 85% white. Wow. It's, and we've tried to change that, but it's still dominated by white males. Yeah. And it's it's an old boy fraternity culture, unfortunately. And so I knew that going into it. And, and so from a medical school standpoint, I kind of knew that I needed to be in certain spots to be eligible to get that. Yeah. So I worked pretty hard in, uh, in medical school to try to make sure I at least put, give myself a chance to get that. Yeah. So you got it. So got it. And so which was exciting right. for a minute, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. R- residency was, frankly, I, it was awful. I would never go through that again. So in, in the early 2000s, they changed the work rules. So it used to be they could work as many hours as they run. So we'd re- routinely, I'd work 120 hours a week and, and make it home for just a few hours. And it was just, I mean, it was frankly unsafe and it was military. It's right. dangerous. I would not want someone operating on me after they've been working all day. <laughs> 24 hours straight. Yeah. So and it was dangerous. It was militaristic. You had people just screaming at you like you're in some sort of military. And, you know, you're looking around and I'm like, I've worked my butt off. I'm a physician trying to get here. And I've got some guy screaming at me like I'm two years old. Um, yeah. Yeah. It was it, it was a struggle for me. Um, and you just you said you're not good with authority. So this was. Right. So we, we would extra have these, hard. We would have guys there who you knew had issues getting picked on when they were young and they now they were put in a position of power. And so they're bully bullying essentially, would you say? Right. So we yeah. had this spine surgeon and he was 
he kind of fit the a little bit of the stereotype. He was probably five foot four, and you know I'm I'm a big guy, like almost six five. And he just decided that I was going to be his boy. I remember one time, you know, we used to have uh, X-ray films, and and I was at home, and he paged me, and he said, "What are you doing?" And I said, "Well, I'm home seeing my family." He said, "Well, there's a set of X-rays down on the floor below me." And I said, "Yeah." He's like, "I want you to drive in and and walk those up to me." And so things like that, and making sure that. I knew where I fit in the in the pecking order. So that was kind of residency for me. It was a really yeah. tough, tough five years. Do you have a worst scenario story from residency, like the the peak story? I mean, that wasn't nice what he did, but I'm, I'll bet there was some worse stuff, yeah? Yeah, so for example, so uh, w- when you go into residency, a surgical residency, your first year, you do a general surgery year. So you do vascular surgery and general surgery just to teach you kind of the general principles of caring for a surgical patient. And the first day of orthopedics, so it would have been my second year of residency, I start off on the spine service with the guy in question who I had never really known yet. The first day I walk in on my first morning and I'm in surgery that morning. Mm-hmm. And so I have no idea what I'm doing and I'm standing there and they're doing this complex spine procedure and 15 minutes into it, the lady dies on the table. Heart stops. Mm. Oh. So we, we flip her over and you know I'm, I'm, I'm the youngest one in the room. So I jump up on the table and I'm doing chest compressions on the lady. Yeah. And I'm wearing all this lead because you operate in lead a lot of times. T- so the x-ray machines don't, don't hurt you. And so I was up for about 15 20 minutes doing chest compressions. I don't know if you've ever done real chest compressions. It's absolutely exhausting, exhausting to do it for five minutes. It's not like you see on TV where they just gently push it and, and you gently break ribs while it's happening. So I'm feeling these things happening and I just looking around the room in this surreal moment and she just died. And so we had to walk out and, you know, my first day and the husband's like, Hey doc, how'd it go? And you have to tell this man, tell this man that, his wife is dead and it was i'll never you were you were the one to tell him i was with i was with him and uh and he brought his colleague and the colleague who i respected he said you need to come see this because at some point in your career you're gonna have to do this yeah and it it really hit home that yeah i'm going into a career where people are gonna serious and i'm gonna have to talk to them and so yeah the fact that that was my first day ever in orthopedic was a bit of an eye-opener yeah so, so with that said, oftentimes in, in uh, orthopedics, uh, you do a fellowship, which is an extra year of training to become sort of subspecialized or even extra specialized in some particular right. type of surgery. So I went and did sports medicine out in Los Angeles at a very flashy clinic called yeah. Curlin, Curlin Job Clinic. So they took care of the Lakers and they took care of the Dodgers and treat, treated the stars. So that was a very fun year of seeing all the celebrities and sitting at the bench at the Lakers games and doing some surgery too, but a very sort of relaxed year of fun. Anna was out there too. So she got to enjoy all the celebrity aspects and and having fun. So I I almost call that the calm before the storm because I think I had, I had in my mind at this point that, you know, you, you reach these thresholds and these milestones and then you get into practice and you, and you build up your practice and then you just ride off into the sunset and it's all good that you reach this, destination. And I think that's right. I had this in my mind. Well, I know this sucks and you're working hard, but just keep focus. You're going to reach this destination. Right. And then it'll be, you'll be happy and, and then you'll just satisfied be happy and, and, good. and content and you practice for 30, 40 years and it's all you're right off into the sunset. And so I took a job and I joined a practice in Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. And we bought a massive house that we couldn't afford, but this was before the crash, so you could buy a huge house with no money down. Yeah. In fact, I think we somehow got money back when we closed on our house. I don't know how that happens. <laughs> and um, and so we didn't we we couldn't afford furniture to put in it, so we had this huge house. So I remember my kids used to ride their bikes through the house. It was like eight thousand square feet, and you know, so at that point now I'm like, okay, I have this huge house, and I have to make sure I have the house payments, and I have to make enough money to pay the rent and or pay the mortgage right. and everything. So <laughs> I, So now you're in the American dream. American dream <laughs> slash 
I already put the noose around my neck with an anchor to, you know, to, to this pressure on me to perform and to produce. Yeah. And, but I took off running sort of my, my, my life's mantra has been, well, if you're struggling, if there's an issue, you just work harder. If you work harder, right. it'll work out. And that's kind of my blue collar upbringing. That's how you manage through these things. Mm-hmm. And so I started practice on the ground running and hit the ground running and just worked as much as I could. I took extra call. I worked extra weekends. I just basically did everything possible to build this practice up. And mm -hmm. I was pretty black and white back then. And I think when you're young, you tend to, the world's very clear to you oftentimes when you're young, it's you're either this or that, everything's black or white and much less is gray. And so I said, well, you need to do this to, you know, for your practice to grow, you need to do these things. And, and that worked as far as growing my practice. And I, you know, developed a patient base and I developed my team and I really grew this practice into this sort of massive thing. The basketball team that I had played for many years before, I came back and was their team doctor. So I got to kind of be full circle on that. And I ultimately achieved, you know, I had sat there 10 years earlier talking to this guy who said, hey, I'm the team doctor for my team. And I said, I'm going to be him. And so I came back and actually took his job from him. You did it. I did it. But never, ever took a moment to realize the satisfaction of that. Wow. So you didn't, when it happened, there was no acknowledgement of that you had achieved what you said you're going to do? Because it's always the next thing for me. And, yeah. And, and what I've learned. I think that's co common, John. You're not alone. <laughs> building process for me is, is what I get my fix off of I've learned it's not the completion and so through my life I complete something that's big that should be big and I gloss over it and I am already stressed about the next thing right so by six or seven years into practice I was I was living this life to where I was still working 80 80 plus hours a week I was frankly making more money than I could spend I was, you know, Charlotte's top doctor voted by my colleagues. We, we, we had 100 guys in our practice, 100 orthopedic surgeon. I think I was number two in productivity. I was, wow. the vi I was the vice president of the group, had this massive house, fancy car. We put in pools and I was as miserable as I've ever been in my life, more miserable than I've ever been in my life. And, you know, I... I and you're supposed to be very happy. I know. With all that. <laughs> I, <laughs> you know... <laughs> I, this moment I was, I realized, when I realized that that moment, that destination moment, that you're there, that was never going to come and, and this is it, mm -hmm. I, I was devastated by that. Right. There's no more. And it's. There, there's, there's not another segment. There's not another residency. There's not another school. There's not another. I, I had achieved all the steps. Right. And you're miserable. And it's probably even harder feeling miserable when on the outside it seems like you should be happy so there's this you know struggle of like well what's wrong with me why am i not enjoying this right you took the words out of my mouth so i even went to see people because there's something so wrong with me because why am i not absolutely elated at what i've accomplished yeah so i went to psychologists i went to psychiatrists i read books. I was searching. I could not figure out what was wrong with me. And the psychiatrists, they just, you know, they, they put me on antidepressants and anti-anxiety medicines. And I took those for two months and hated how I felt. Yeah. Psychologists who kind of talked to me about my lifestyle. And I just, I don't know if I wasn't ready to hear it, but I just knew something was wrong. And, you know, every Sunday I would, you know, basically crawl up in the fetal position at home thinking, oh my God, I have to go back. And I remember I used to, <laughs> I was laughing the other night we were out because I had talked to another doc about this. I used to sort of dream and think about, I'd be driving to work and daydream about getting hurt because if I had a hand cut off or something like that, I didn't have to do it anymore. And oh my gosh. I'm like, how screwed up is it that these are the things I'm thinking about so that I don't have to do this anymore because to admit that this wasn't what I wanted was an epic failure to me. Um, yeah. And I've, I've still struggled with that a little bit. 
so you were struggling. You didn't, I mean, realize that you do, you could make the decision to stop the train and get off the train without cutting your hands off, but that was too hard to. You know, in, in medicine, you don't leave medicine. It's particularly surgeons. You don't meet a whole lot of surgeons who just leave. Why, why not? In, you know, most careers, people change careers five to seven times, but in medicine, no, there's a huge stigma. So ultimately, you know, people ask me what was, you know, if I was, when I did do leaving, which we'll get to, I was asked if I was wanted by the FBI, if I was in. Yeah. Like, what? I, <laughs> yeah, you would not believe the questions I got asked because you just don't leave, particularly orthopedic surgery. Like, why would you leave this lucrative career? P- people just didn't get it. I felt like a failure for admitting it. But mm-hmm. I felt like I was living someone else's life, and I I did not know how to get out of it. Well, and at the, so at the time, I guess you also didn't realize that there was other orthopedic surgeons and doctors that were unhappy like you. Did you feel you felt like you were the only one at that point, right? Absolutely, I felt alone. Okay, and I felt my training had put blinders on me that there's no other options out there. I I wasn't aware of other communities of people like me who were struggling like me particularly in my world of orthopedics. Right. And the piv- uh, another pivotal thing happened is that two of my colleagues dropped dead within a short period of time of each other. One was in yeah. his late 40s. And <laughs> he, was, he was getting sued by a professional athlete for something he did not do wrong. And he was getting right. in his car to go to court and had a heart, a- heart attack and died that morning. Wow. And I sat at his funeral and it was eye opening. I said, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to live my life like this and, and be this. I don't know. I, <laughs> I think that was the thing that ultimately made me say, I'm going to change something. Wow. And so the, <laughs> at that point, the biggest change is I agreed to take a month long vacation with my wife. Okay. That's a step. That's a step. I had never taken more than a week of vacation in my life because I felt that that was for wusses or if you're going to rehab, that's the only reason why you take more than a week off. Mm-hmm. And so she got me to go to Australia for a month. And about two weeks in, two and a half weeks, I truly disconnected for the first time in you know 20 years from what I was doing. I just was away from it long enough that I did. Mm-hmm. And we were walking in the outback and some lady says, you know, we desperately need orthopedic surgeons on this side of the world. You should come over here and work a little bit. Mm-hmm. So I'm sitting in a bar in Melbourne, Australia, and I get on my computer and I realized that there's all these jobs and I set up a job interview for New Zealand uh, while I'm sitting in Australia and do a Zoom interview and go home and tell my wife, hey, listen, I want to move to New Zealand with the family. <laughs> did you did you feel like that was going to fix the problem, though, because you were just going to do the same thing in a different location? If you look on a map, it's almost as far away in the world as I could get from where I was. And all I okay is that I wanted to get it was far away from sort of geographically in my mind. It meant separating from that. Okay. And I also, because I didn't think I could leave orthopedics totally, I didn't know there was another option. Or I just didn't appreciate that. I thought, hey, well, at least I can do what I'm doing now and do it in a different situation and see if that makes it better. Yeah. And so I had this traumatic event for my family and moving them to the other side of the world. In retrospect, it was one of the best things we ever did for our family. It disconnected to a, disconnected us from a lot of the the rat race we were on. Uh-huh. Um, and so we were there for a year and a half, and we actually had a great year and a half. Cool. And so, of course, we're coming back to the U.S., and I'm thinking, what am I going to do? And I, I go, all right, I'm going to go back to my same practice, but I'm going to do it different this time. I'm going to take these principles and slow down pace of life. And I'm going to try to apply that once I get back. Okay, good. So I get back and within a year, I'm like, this is the same old BS, but with a few more twists. Number one, I just, I wasn't believing in what I was doing anymore. You know, the surgical world were productivity driven and you're procedural driven and there's pressure on you to perform as many procedures as possible. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I struggle with the fact that when we'd get studies that come out that showed, hey, for this particular fracture, if you operate on it, they do better. Everyone starts operating on it. But when the same study comes out and says, hey, these ones actually do better when you don't operate on them, no one stops. Yeah. And I, I just was feeling these ethical problems. You know, my wife had moved into holistic medicine and 
she had gotten me to change my diet and sort of clean up my life. And, you know, I spend five minutes with these people and say, listen, you're too heavy. I can't do a knee replacement. Come back and see me when you've lost 200 pounds, but absolutely do nothing or give them tools to help them there. And I just, I almost couldn't tolerate living with myself practicing like that mm-hmm. uh, and putting, putting productivity and these other things in the, in the, my group kind of pushed toward that, putting those above, above these people's lives. It just didn't make sense to me anymore. And I felt like I was more of the problem than the solution at that point. And so with that said, I told my group I was leaving again. They were not real happy with me given this was the second time I had done this. And both times I had these pretty big practices. Yeah. And when was this the second time? It was at the end of 2018. Okay. Uh, And I decided I was going to do travel medicine for a while. Okay. So So you've had a lot of leaving. (laughs) Okay. 2018. This is the 2018 leave. (laughs) This is a guy who doesn't want to admit what he knows to be true, but he's trying to desperately find a way to to make it happen. Yeah. It's orthopedic surgery. So there's a shortage of orthopedic surgeons in the United States. And so everyone wants orthopedic surgeons just because there's Mm -hmm. not enough. It's an aging population. So you can just fly to another state and operate for a week. So are less less, uh, med students going into orthopedic surgery or what's happening? Why is there a shortage? Yeah, the training pro it's it's uh the training programs can't accommodate enough people. M- Medicare pays for the training programs largely. You know Medicare's in trouble, so it's a financial problem. Mm-hmm. The other thing is they have too many orthopedic surgeons in the big cities, but the rest mm-hmm. of the country has not enough. So overall, there's a shortage. Yeah, it's, it's multiple issues. Yeah. So then I was flying to Muncie, Indiana, for a week a month and operating and I was living in this crappy apartment in Muncie, Indiana at the, in the Ball State dormitories. And I'm financially independent at this point, but I still can't stop because in my mind, I'm one month away from laying back in my high school locker room, broke and nothing to do. I just, it's funny, you, it, that mentality, that scarcity thing with me, that security thing, I just can't I've struggled to shake. I'll put it that way. Right. And that wasn't realistic because you were very financially secure and abundant at that point, right? Yeah. It's not, it's not always, not always rational, you know? (laughs) Yeah, no, I realize. I just want to. The frustrating is when you know it's not rational and you still can't rationalize it, if that makes sense. So you're doing travel medicine. It's 2018. It doesn't sound like an upgrade to your life. You're in Indiana in a shitty dorm room. (laughs) Yep. And, and, and literally thinking, I, you know, I'm a 48 year old orthopedic surgeon who's well off and I'm sleeping in this shitty apartment in Muncie, Indiana. And I'm like, what the hell am I doing with my life? And laying there and I'm on call and, they, you know, I'm up all night like I was when I was, you know, 30 year old resident. And I just I had a moment where I am like, this is nuts. This is you are really losing your mind. Yeah. And that's when I said, you got to start finding something else. And so I had already kind of been following a number of these. I'd found some communities. So there is this thing called the dropout club, which is groups of of docs who are looking for other directions Uh, and things about financial and entrepreneurial aspects uh, for doctors to learn other avenues. Mm -hmm. As I follow those more, you know, I said, I got to find something else. And so my wife's practice, she's, I said, you know, those weeks I'm home, how about I start helping with the finances of your practice? And, you know, she had a several month long waiting list. And, I, and then I started thinking, well, you know, you have months, you're waiting, people are waiting to see you. What, what if we created an online course with some of those people and gave them another option to do it? So then I created an online course and started building that in the background. And then she didn't have time to write the blog. Well, I'm like, well, I have time to write a blog in the meantime. And I guess before I realized that I had started creating these other businesses on the side, but it really was just something to fill my time in between. So at this point, you're still doing surgery plus the side stuff. Surgery plus the side stuff. Okay. And... <laughs> Despite the fact I didn't need to do this financially, so we get to about January. So now we're just 12, 11 months ago, January of 21, and I'm still doing the same thing. I said, okay, if, if, if we had a certain amount of revenue with these things I've built, then I'll consider quitting. And finally, by 
I think April of 21, I kind of looked at the bank statement and I said, we're there. <laughs> Despite the fact we really, I was there years ago, I could have done this, but I just giving it up and, and I'll get into that in a little bit is the transition's a struggle. And so I gave my notice and I worked till May and in May, I kind of put up the knife and, and uh, the, <laughs> one interesting story is I'm, is I'm, so my last day and I'm thinking, all right, this is, could be it for me. I may never operate again. This guy comes in and he's already had his leg cut off once and the rest of his leg has died and needs now needs to be cut off again, way up at his hip. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I've these good parts I've had in my career, you know, this thing is awful, you know, this leg, you know, in orthopedics, you see a lot of bad stuff and it's, yeah, it's this fungating open wound of, of terribleness. And you go in and he, you know, this guy's never going to walk anymore and he got to cough his leg. And I'm like, I do not want this to be my last memory. Surgery. Yeah. Surgery. So I, I remember I found a, a general surgeon who I, I kind of knew. And I said, listen, I got to tell you something. I said, I'm leaving medicine possibly permanently. And today's my last day. And I really don't want to walk out of this hospital with that being my last thing. And he goes, man, I am so envious of you. I will absolutely cut it off for you. <laughs> and He's envious of you leaving. Envious of me leaving. And interestingly, since I have, that's been a common theme. So in May, I left. and So May 21, which is not that long ago, about six months ago, you left. That was your last day. It was. Wow. You know, and, and I had always said, I want every day to be a Saturday. Be like a Saturday. And for about six weeks, it was wonderful. And then mm -hmm. I absolutely freaked out because every day was like a Saturday. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I had no idea how much of my ego and maybe even self self worth was tied up in this identity as a identity as a doctor. surgeon. And and so I really had a I had a tough summer this past summer, uh, just coming to terms with that and not feeling like I failed. What I was getting out of that, I think some of the validation then. You know, I tried to ask my marriage for that, which puts a heck of a lot of pressure on the marriage when you're trying to get career satisfaction out of that. Right. And and I can't tell you that I'm completely past with that, but by August, I had decided, okay, I'm going to go fully in on creating an online business and this part of things and the entrepreneurial aspect. Right. And so with that, that has helped. I can tell you, I've never ever again had a Sunday where I'm curled up in the fetal position. The, well, that's positive. It is. <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm absolutely at this point so happy that I did it. Yeah, you did it. I did it. And some people may never do it, right? A lot of people. So I've gotten all these calls since then. How did you do it? I don't think I can do it. You know, I have guys who told me that they're cold. They've been in a cold sweat for 20 years every weekend night like I was. And I'm wow. like, how do you, how do you do that? I mean, you have one life. How are you going to live your life like that? I think whether you're an entrepreneur or doing that kind of job, you always can have the struggles of, you know, my achieving the career things I want. And you start thinking about different aspects of your career and what your legacy is. And my, my time with being surgery, I'm thankful that it put me in a financial situation to have a lot of flexibility. I mean, I work my ass off and... You know, I gave up my 20s and 30s where a lot of friends were enjoying themselves. And so I definitely paid the price for, for, to have this flexibility. I'm just trying to find the headspace now to truly enjoy it. Right. But I'm, I'm happiest when I'm building something. And that's kind of what I've come to realize that it's not once it's built, it's not the, its destination. I just want to be building. That's when I'm happiest. And, and so it's, sometimes it's as simple as being in my yard, building something in my yard or in my house. This morning I wrote a chapter for our book. And for me, that's a build. That's a invent, yeah. create. And are you able to enjoy the building and the satisfaction of the completion now? Are you finding ways to take a moment to enjoy the accomplishments? Trying. I I'm doing better yeah. at it. I you know, what's yeah. funny is that when you when you go from a highly defined career like surgery, where my day 
was this carefully constructed. I mean, it, technically it was a house of cards, but it was at least carefully constructed. I mean, it was, I would do five surgeries and I would see 30 patients in the office, and, you know, and I would, at the end of the day, I'd run to the hospital and do something and then I would come home. So it was this clearly defined day and I could walk in and say, wow, I did all these things today, like a checklist and I'm done. Right. You know, as, a, as an entrepreneur, my list right now, I, I could never be done with all the stuff I have to do. It's, it's a, it's a yeah. ne- never ending list of books to write and these things to build. So you have to sort of get your fix of how you're having those completions and those goals and those little victories. You have to start defining that. And so I have to just sort of start the day and say, all right, what few things can I get done today that I can look back at the day and say, that was a good day. Yeah. I had set my and standards w- so high on what a, what a successful day was. Right. It's been tough to match that, right? <laughs> because I, I had these, I look back, I'm like, I cannot believe how much stuff I used to do in what a day. What you did. Yeah. Because I, you know, it started 5 a.m. and I would work till the night. And so I've had to reset my criteria for that. Right. But I'm a new person. My, my family enjoys being around me. I'm not a complete asshole like I was a lot of the time. When, when you're working like that, someone's going to pay a price. Yeah. Because it's... <laughs> Because, you know, I was just a miserable bastard a lot of the time, unfortunately. So you're happier now. What makes you happier now? Like just to elicit, what is it about this versus how life was then? Probably the biggest thing is a, at least a sense of control over my life. I felt like uh, before that I, someone else was dictating a significant amount of my time. Mm-hmm. Them telling me, you know, when I was going to operate and waiting on the hospital to get stuff done or, you know, someone has this problem and I have to go in and take care of it. I felt like a significant portion of my time I didn't control. Yeah. And I feel like I've taken that part back. And that's probably the number one thing, particularly with things like call, you know, being up all night. You, you can do that. I could do that back when in my 20s and 30s. And I've, I've found now as I've gotten in my late 40s, I mean, you're up all night. It takes me days to recover from that. Yeah, no, it's not good. <laughs> Uh, and, 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 and frankly, people suffer and, you know, they've changed is interestingly, you know, they changed the residency training hours, but they've not changed anything in practice. So even if I'm up four nights in a row, there's no rules or recommendations that I do anything, cancel surgeries or anything. Wow. I have bigger expectations for the world in 2021. I, f- I feel like we've been struggling with the same problems for so many decades and we just... <laughs> Why don't why do we just keep doing things the way they're done versus evolving them? I guess change is tough and people are resistant Ugh. as hell to change. But yeah, yeah. You, you ignorance is bliss. You probably don't want to know a lot of the stuff that's going on behind the scenes, Frank. Behind the scenes in medicine. Now, isn't it true that I think it's doctors and maybe lawyers have like the highest rate of suicide and maybe even drug addiction? Am I getting that right? They do. They do. Yeah. And the, the pressures are immense. And again, you know, when I came through training, any, you know, any complaints or things like that were seen as a sign of weakness. And, mm-hmm. you know, I remember <laughs> I was an intern and my first day in general surgery and I was taking care of all these sick people and the chief resident, he's getting ready to go. He's like, all right, Temple. He's like, listen, any problems, call me. But remember, calling is a sign of weakness. And then he walks out the door. <clears throat> uh, but that was kind of the mantra all the way through. And, and I think that goes well into practice. It's just you put your head down. Physician's just supposed to, you know, you have this handle it moral responsibility. You handle it. And it's it's a weakness if you can't manage it. And th- right. I think that's or a weakness to even say you don't know. I've found that, too, to, like you're supposed to know everything. Right. <laughs> And I think that's probably why I've had such problem leaving it is because that's been so ingrained into my, into my head that you're weak if you, if you leave. Yep. And I hated that. And I I occasionally still, you know, because people will say, oh, well, I said, well, you know, I wasn't with the surgeon. Well, what happened? You know, what's, what's wrong with you? Why would you leave that? It's always the, what, what's wrong? Why wouldn't you stop doing that? Whereas if someone said, oh, you know, I was in this business and I shifted over here, no one asked twice. Right. Yeah. So interesting. Do you think the culture of medicine, so to speak, will ever change? I mean, is there 
Well, so there are some good things happening. There? So number one, okay. there are now many more female medical students than male medical students. And I, I do think that women will help bring a different atmosphere to medicine in a, in a good way. And they're trying to change things like orthopedics to, to be more, uh, to get more women involved and to make it a, a just, um, just have a little bit more diversity for gosh sakes. Yeah, I hope so. Or else those women are just going to get bullied and beat down too. And it's the same game. Right. But I think it's at a transition point, you know, supposedly with what ha- what's happened in COVID, that physician morale is at its lowest that it's been in many, many years. Yeah. But typically, these are the times that changes occur. So maybe one of the positive things that ends up coming out of COVID is a true fundamental change to how physicians work and or particularly, I mean, how, how physicians support each other. I think we've been notoriously poor at sort of supporting each other as we go through these things. Yeah, it's it's quite um, competitive, right? Rather than collaborative. Right. I mean, when I was leaving, I had really no support of guys going, yeah, you're doing the right thing. You know, I had one colleague who's a mentor who left years ago to, to do something else. And I remember meeting him. I, I met him this past summer. I said, you know, Dan, I'm struggling with this. And he said, listen, number one, I'm proud of you. And it's the first time I ever heard those words, except for my wife, of someone in a business world saying, I'm proud of you for leaving that. And it was it was huge for me. I told him that. I said, wow, that feels really good to have someone actually say, like to say you did the right thing or you, just to give you support for what you did. Yeah. That was really cool. Well, I'm proud of you, John. I mean, that's what this podcast is all about. Like, I think we deserve to lead a satisfying, happy life. And that's personal to each person. And to not do that and continue to... But you've done a very courageous and brave thing, actually. Like the thing that some people are unwilling to do, right? Yeah. Um, to, to make that change. And so we continue to just be miserable internally, just like, that's really sad to me. So if we can get more people to wake up to like how, you know, living the life that they want to be living, not what society tells us to be living, I think our world would be a better place. And so you're a good example of that, taking the steps and you're on the journey right now. Like it was only a few months ago that this happened. So I know you don't have it all figured out, but you're, you're on the road. Well, I was going to say to you is kudos to you because listening to podcasts like this, it gives people the knowledge or maybe they can embrace the fact that other people are going through this. Because if I would have felt more like, hey, at least there's other people like me, I kind of thought I was like this enigma of just that's why there's something wrong with me. And I think you getting people to talk about this, people listen to that, it's liberating for them. They go, hey, at least I know I'm not alone. There's people like this. It's it would have been great for me to have had something like that when I was sort of in the depth of it. So, yeah. Yeah. Is there any like words of advice or, uh, you know, what would you say to people out there that might be listening that are struggling with where and are where you were? Is there something that you'd like to say to them? So I was, I was very poor at reaching out for support and I, I, didn't want to admit that I was having a problem because again, I felt like that was weak. And so my number one piece of advice is seek support, whether that's a friend or a colleague that you feel like you could talk to or a counselor or something like that. I would just seek help and talk to someone. I think that's huge. Yeah. And acknowledge and verbalize the problem could be a big step, right? Absolutely. And I guess the second thing I'll say is that, man, I waited way too long to do this. Life is short, and I I, I, took, I went through years of misery, avoiding a, a decision I knew I was going to make. And if you if your listeners have never asked themselves the Kinder questions, K I N D E R, they're life questions that are fundamental. I would recommend every single one of them who are not sure if this is what they want to do, go take the Kinder questions. You can Google it, and if you don't answer those questions the right way, is something you want long term, change your life. That's that's my advice. Wonderful. And what is next for you on this on this journey towards greater satisfaction and happiness? Well, the thing that's awesome is once you make this decision, I remember when my kids are going to college, I said to them, 
man, I'm so jealous of you. You can. I remember going to college and thinking I could be anything I want to be. And and I remember going to them. Wow, that would be really cool to have that. And I I guess I had this realization that I could be anything I want to be. And once you embrace that, and now I've got a lot of knowledge behind me. I've got a lot of life experience. I've got funding to do these things. So now I'm as excited as I've ever been about recreating myself. And so I want to continue to build things. And so I'm going to build our online programs. And, and it's funny, I was talking to my wife. It, it, to me, it, it, it's not as important what I'm building as that I'm building something. That's, that's where I get my, my fix from. Mm-hmm. You know, right now I'm writing a book on pediatric eczema which is not my specialty, but I love doing research and I love the writing process. So I want to continue writing. I want to build an online presence. I want to scale our program so we can help many, many thousands of people, not just the, the people we can see in, in the office. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm keeping an open mind. I mean, the, the, the beauty of Think Was Where I Am is that truly I, I feel like I can go do anything I want to do. I love it. Art, we can whatever we can imagine we can do so it's like you're in college all over again with open opportunity right to re so i guess a message would be like it doesn't matter how old we are but there's a we can always choose to recreate or reinvent ourselves right and that's what i'm doing and i, I that part of it i'm absolutely loving i love it and i'm sure anna maria is very excited to have you on her team that sounds like a good benefit for her business i mean to have a, I, I have to admit to have a supportive spouse through all this has been huge and she has been supportive she's like if you don't want to do it stop doing it you know she told me to quit years ago uh and yeah. i'm the one that wouldn't uh, right so that's been great and yeah she's sort of got the benefits that now you know i tell everyone i'm her personal assistant basically now but uh now in, in reality i'm actually really enjoying the, the things that I'm doing and I get to pick and choose what I want to do. And that's yeah. great. And there's no boss telling me what to do other than occasionally my wife, but Hey, that's, yeah. that's every marriage a little bit, I guess. That's, that's normal. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and you're helping kids with holistic medicine, which I think is wonderful. Cause to me, you know, raising healthy kids and, you know, preventative medicine is very important. So if we can get our children to be as healthy as possible, that's, to me where it starts so we can hopefully prevent them being in the hospital overweight and sick and needing surgeries, right? <laughs> well, John, this has been a wonderful episode. I'm really excited um, to publish it um, soon and I'll let you know when that's happening. And where can people find you and Anna Maria's work? So the best place to go is to dranamaria.com. That's D-R-A-N-A-M-A-R-I-A dranamaria.com and from there you can get to our blog uh, which which has a lot of just great general information but a lot of eczema information uh, we're shortly uh, launching our supplement store which we're uh, proud of and that that will be connected to the dranamaria.com site as well and also we have multiple online programs including a great pediatrics holistic manual if you just want to know how to care for your kids holistically there's a great manual there so you can get those all through the website Wonderful. Um, it's been such an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. And I really thank you for sharing your story. I know it's personal, and intimate, um, but I know it's going to help a lot of people. So okay. thank you. Thanks, Sarah. It's been, been wonderful doing it. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Are You Satisfied podcast. Links for any mentions from this episode are available in the show notes. If you'd like to connect with me, go to drsarahmurphy.com. That's drsarahmurphy.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. Definitely tell all your friends about it and leave a review. See you next week. Music